Hello, this is John from caveofprogramming.com. In this video, we're going to look at for loops in Kotlin. So the idea of looping is that you execute some code repeatedly, and we're gonna look at how to do that here in this video. So the most basic form of what we call the for loop in Kotlin looks like this. Let's say that we want a loop which is gonna repeat three times. So first we need the for keyword, and the syntax is actually similar to if and various other constructs, we then have open and close round brackets. And usually we have curly brackets after that. And in here, instead of having a condition as we would have with if, we have some instructions about how the loop should actually run. So with for loops, we have a thing called a loop variable, which in many cases will just be some number that counts up sequentially. So I'm gonna write I here, and this is actually a variable declaration, although it doesn't look like it. And this is what we call the loop counter. And then we're gonna say in, and then let's say 0 0.2. So this is actually gonna set this variable i to the value 0, 1, and 2. And to prove that, let's write in here, print ln. And I'll use a string here, and let's just print out the value of i with a space after it. And actually, I want all of those to come out on the same line because it's going to be easier to read, I think. So let's run it. And you can see we've printed out 0, 1, and 2. So we've run this three times. And each time it ran, i was set to a different value. It was set first to 0, then to 1, then to 2. Now, usually when we declare variables, we don't want to use a single letter for the variable name. But with loops, it is really common to use variable names that have a single letter, typically i, j, k, sometimes n. And within the context of a loop, it's clear to everyone usually what that actually means. It's the loop counter. Now, this is a variable declaration. We didn't use val or var, but within the context of a loop, this actually does create a variable. However, notice the variable is only available within whatever comes directly after the for loop which is either going to be a single statement or else one or more statements in curly brackets like this, which we call a code block. So i is not available after those curly brackets are closed. It's turned red, you can see, because i is not available down here. We can only use i within these curly brackets. We say that the curly brackets are the scope of this variable. They are the region where the variable actually exists. Let's take a look at another example. So supposing I want i to go from, let's say, 10 to 13, up to and including 13. So I can write for i in 10 dot dot 13. And now usually we put curly brackets after the for. If you have multiple statements that you want to execute repeatedly in the loop, you need the curly brackets to contain those statements to define what's actually part of the loop. But if you only want to execute one statement, you can miss the curly brackets off. Usually I put them in anyway, because I think it's less confusing. But just so we can fit more on a page in this tutorial, here I am gonna miss them off. Let's actually just repeat this. Let's put this here, right there. And that's a perfectly valid loop, and if we run it, Actually, that's a bit confusing because I don't have any blank line here in the output. Let's write print ln and leave it empty because that will create a blank line in the output and make it easier to read. So you can see this is coming from our second loop now. A slight twist on this is the case where you don't want the end point of the range to be included in the loop. Let's have a blank line here and then I'm just going to copy this paste it here, and after the double dots, I'm gonna write a less than sign. And you can see here, the IDE, IntelliJ, has actually put in a mathematical style less than or equal sign to help clue me into what's actually going on here. So 10 is always going to be less than or equal to i. In other words, i is going to start at 10, and it's going to keep going as long as i is less than or equal to 13. In other words, i is going to end up being 13 on the last iteration of the loop, the last time the loop executes. Here, there's no 
less than or equal, there's only this less than sign. That's cluing us into the fact that the loop will stop running when i is now equal to 12. It's not going to reach 13. So if we run this, we can see we've got 10, 11 and 12 now. What if we want the loop to go down instead of up? We can also do that. Let's again have a blank line in the output. And let's create a loop that counts down from, let's say 15 to 10. So I'm gonna write four i in 15 down to, with a capital T, 10. And then we'll have that print line in there again as well. And notice that I am declaring multiple different i's here. You can't declare two variables with the same name. Like you couldn't write val i equals seven and then further on down in your program, write val i equals eight. You can't re-declare a variable when you've already declared it. But the reason it works here is that the scope of i is limited to these brackets. So that means that we can have more variables called i later on. They're completely different variables to the original i. Now let's run this and we're gonna start now at 15 and go all the way down to and including 10, like this. And we can also add in a step keyword if we want to jump in steps. So for example, let's put a blank line in the output and suppose I want to count from four to 22, let's say, in steps of two. Let's write four i in, what did I say, four dot dot 22. That'll do anyway. And now after that, I'm gonna write step two. And let's put a print line in here. And if I run that, now we're gonna start at four. We're going to go up to and including 22, but in steps of two, so four, six, eight, 10, and so on. You can also use step with down to. It goes right here in the same location that it does with this dot dot operator variation. Now we've seen all that, I just wanna point something out which may be of interest to you. You're probably not really gonna use it in your code. The way that I've just shown you to write four loops that have a loop counter involved in them is the way that we've just seen normally. But I want to show you something that may be interesting. I'm gonna put print line there. I actually couldn't fit much of this on one page anyway, even if I do miss out the curly brackets. But do normally put in the curly brackets, by the way. Normally it's best to write a for loop with curly brackets like this because it's clearer. Otherwise you're only going to execute the next statement immediately after the for. So if we write something like, let's maybe take this example here and just paste it down there. It may surprise you to know that operators in Kotlin are actually kind of syntactic sugar for methods. So let me show you what I mean. Let's just maybe comment this out for a second. If I write print line two plus three, so that's just gonna print out five on its own line, but it's actually equivalent to writing two dot plus three. Gotta get the bracket on the end there. You have to make sure the brackets are balanced it's two brackets here, so there's gotta be two brackets there. And it's written other here, that's coming from the IDE. It's not part of the code. It's not an actual bit of text that's in my code. It's just a hint. And we're gonna look at what that means later on in the course. But this plus here is a function that's attached to the int class. So we call it a method because it's a function that's basically part of a class. So we're calling the plus method on this two value and we're supplying three to it. And that is exactly equivalent to this. So when you see operators in Kotlin, you know that behind the scenes, there is some method or function that's being run. You can see we've got two fives here. And that is also true, for example, with this operator. So let's uncomment this. I'm gonna maybe put a blank line in there. And instead of using this, we could use, let's delete it, dot range two. So now we're calling a method on this 10. 
and we're supplying it with the value 13. We say 13 is an argument that we're supplying to the range2 method. And if we run this, it does exactly the same thing as the equivalent with the double dot. So here you can see it's counting from 10 up to and including 13. So this second bit right here after the in is always some entity that supplies what we call an iterator, which is a thing that allows us to actually do the iteration, in other words, the looping. And we'll look at that in more detail later on in the course. But if we hover over range two here, it shows us that it is a function. And we say that it's returning something of type int range. This is actually what we call a class. So you, you don't really need to know this if you're a new programmer. And this is the first time you've seen a for loop. This is not vital knowledge at this stage. Later on it will be, but I'll explain it better later on. But for the moment, just for your interest, I want to show you this. So that means that we could actually write this in yet another way. So let's write print line here to get a blank line in the output. I'll put a blank line in my code as well. Paste this down here. And we could write here int range. And we could go from, let's say this time we'll go from 7 up to and including 9. So I need a 7 comma 9 in there. And that also works perfectly well. If I run this, we're going to get 7, 8, 9. So there we go. So I just wanted to show you that. And if you're completely new to this, that will probably be all quite puzzling. But I think if we kind of touch on subjects like this early on in the course, later on, when you see the fuller explanation of them, they sort of make a lot more sense. So let's take a look at the code that we've got at the moment. So at the moment, we've got this. And if you're new to programming, this is just for your information, FYI. So the bit that you really need to practice is this stuff here. You need to get the hang of that. And do put the curly brackets in. So I would say always write your for loops like this, at least when you're starting with programming. Later on, you can decide whether you want to put them in or not, if you've just got one statement after the for loop. But I would recommend at the start always using them. So do try that out. And don't forget, if you're struggling to see this, now that I've put it all on one page, more or less. If you go to github.com slash caveaprogramming slash Kotlin, there you can browse the code online and you don't have to register or anything. If you want an exercise at this stage, I would suggest in the last video, we took a look at the basic type of array in Kotlin. Try to write a program once you practice this a bit and got the hang of it somewhat. Try to write a program where you declare an array of whatever you like, numbers or strings, and then write a for loop that iterates over that array and prints it out. So in other words, a for loop that prints out the, all the items in that array one by one, each on its own line, let's say. If you're coming to this from Java or another language, you should be able to figure out a way to do that pretty easily. If you're new to programming, you might have to do some experimentation. And in the next video, since that's an important topic, we're going to look at some different ways that you can actually do that. But from what you've seen already in this course so far, you can probably figure out at least one way of doing it yourself. So that's it for this video. Until next time, happy coding.